All right, let's have our choir come. Amen. We want to welcome you tonight. Grab a hymn book. Turn to hymn number 55. Hymn 55. Let's stand together and sing. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from a dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all his life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. We are thankful to be back in church tonight. We're glad that you're here. We want to have a word of prayer as we get started. John Marcel, you pray for us. Amen. You can be seated and we'll listen to the choir.
As our choir comes down, let's stand one more time this evening and greet one another. Amen. Well, you can be seated. We do want to say welcome to you again. We're glad that you're here, and I'm thankful to be back tonight. I appreciated the message this morning, and just thinking about uh, grace not to fail God's grace, and I appreciated that passage of Scripture, and uh, I'm looking forward again tonight as our pastor preaches for us again, And uh, but we're glad you're here. Don't forget about some of the things that are going on in the life of our church. Don't forget about uh, the men's breakfast uh, at 8.30 coming up on September the 8th. We want you to come be a part of that if you're uh, one of our men here in our church. So don't forget about that. Uh, ladies retreat October the 5th and the 6th. And uh, again, if you need to know about that, please see Miss Angie and she'll help you with it. But I know it's a blessing. I know it's a good, a good trip. It's not long. It's Friday evening, Saturday morning, and then you're back. Uh, Appalachian Bible College is in Beckley, so it's not a long trip. Uh, but uh, it'll be good, it'll be helpful for you, so we'll encourage you to go. Uh, our homecoming is on September the 30th, and we're excited about that. And uh, we'll have a good meal that day, of course, like we always do, and enjoy some time together. Uh, so don't forget about those things. Uh, one thing you'll notice in our bulletin is we need some help uh, with our campus cleanup. And so every month, there's just volunteers from our church that come and clean the church. And uh, at the beginning of the year, we had a sign-up sheet uh, for people to sign up uh, for different months throughout the year to help us uh, clean. And uh, we need somebody to help us in November and December. And so we need you to help us. Uh, we don't want the same people doing it all the time. If we can all take a turn, uh, that'll help us. And so uh, if, you want, if you can do that, let us know. And uh, that will be a big help to us. And, and uh, that's an important thing that we do. It's important to have everything looking nice and clean and uh, ready uh, for each service. So uh, don't forget about that. And uh, the joy, next joy trip is on September the 18th. And uh, then the Hallelujah Fest. We've been praying about that and excited to be getting ready for that. And so we want to encourage you to be thinking about games and those kind of things you can help us with as well. Uh, but we're thankful for that. Um, so lots of things that are going on in our church right now. And uh, we're looking forward to them, but we're glad you're here tonight, and we're excited to hear from our pastor in just a little while. But this time, we'll ask our, our uh, ushers to come, take up our tithes, offering, faith, promise. 
missions offering again this evening. Email. Let's pray together again. Amen. Sunday nights, we always receive our children's change offering for summer camp, and we want to continue to think about camp and uh, how uh, quickly they come, and then it gone, it's gone and over, and then it's coming up again. So, uh, so we don't want to ever think, uh, not uh, be thinking of it, and uh, in our own homes, want to be planning, preparing, just putting aside something throughout the year, so that when it comes time to uh, have camp, we could just make a great investment in it. So. Our, thir- our Sunday night offerings just kind of remind us of that. So if you have some change and some offerings that uh, you want to give, then just get them out and get them ready. And uh, we're going to get all of our elementary school, preschool age boys and girls. Today was Move Up Sunday in Sunday school and in all of our children's ministries. And so uh, this morning, children moved up a class. If they were moving from one grade to another into new classes and uh, also... Also, I like that eagerness, but we got to wait just a second, all right? We're going to pray together. Uh, I like that. You, you ushers, take note of that. That's good. And, uh, but, but, but we've moved up some of the, uh, the, the nursery as well. The nursery moves up. When they reach a certain age, they're just too old, too big to be back there, so they come out in big church, and uh, we're thankful for that. We've got all the moors out in the big church today, so that's a blessing. And uh, I'm excited, Drew, how many of you noticed him? He was learning how to lead the choir while the choir was singing. Anybody notice that? He was over here just trying to, trying to direct as Evan did. And so I'm glad. I hope he grows up to be a good choir leader. We always hard to find. So uh, we're thankful for him. And uh, we're going to pray together. Then uh, they're going to come out and take up our offering together tonight. Lord, we thank you for being good to us today. We thank you for your grace and mercy. And we thank you for summer camp, what it means and how it uh, impacts lives, and Lord, it makes life changes in, in lives. We've seen it in so many people through the years, and God, even the adults that go to help, <clears throat> Lord, you work in our lives as well, so help us to be a church with a heart for camp. We know churches all across the community that have more people in church and have more finances and resources, but they don't have a summer camp, and Lord, they, they can't get people to volunteer to help, to go, to take the time to invest in it, but Lord, help us always have a heart to do it, and uh, we'll just thank you for it. Bless the offering tonight, and these children, uh, we just pray you have your hand on them. They may just grow up, Lord, to serve you with all their heart and life, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have some offering, hold your hand up. They're going to come pick it up.
good job. Thank you. We appreciate the help today and the uh, blessing. We're glad you're here tonight. It's been a good day. We had a good group of folks this morning and uh, folks visiting out. Had a good building with the Bible Hour, first, uh, first, uh, first one of the month. And we hope that uh, if you weren't able to make it this morning, you'll get out and be involved in those classes throughout the month of September. And we're thankful for the Word of God. We're glad, again, you're here tonight. And uh, we want to begin tonight just to look at a new subject, and that is the thought of real Christian. We've looked at what a real church is, and we're going to look at what a real Christian is. And, uh, you know, all things tend to have as their nature that if we don't give them attention, they're going to change. Uh, if you go into manufacturing plants and places that produce a product, uh, they have to continually check the quality of that product to be sure that it stays the same, that it meets certain criteria, that the tolerances, that the, uh, that the original template, the, the original uh, pattern that was developed, that they continue to be sure they give attention to producing that product just as it was intended to, to be produced or otherwise uh, that it, it will become less than what it should be. I believe this is something we're seeing in the world today when it comes to the subject of what is a Christian. And uh, we're going to look at what the Word of God says a Christian should be and what it really means according to God's Word. And uh, if you'll have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of James, chapter 1, and we're going to read several verses of Scripture, but let's just begin in verse 22. And I want to read to verse 25. Now let's look at this uh, idea of a real Christian. And uh, today, I want you to notice that a real Christian, when you see a real Christian, one of the things you're going to see in their life is real caring. Real caring. James 1.22, the Bible said, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Lord, bless your word tonight, empower it by the Holy Spirit, and Lord, do a work today in, your, in our lives that only you can do and help us be obedient for your glory. Uh, Lord, help us to look into this perfect law of liberty, your word. And God, may we, as we would behold our face in a mirror, let you show us what you see when you look at our lives. Help us, Lord, to desire to be a real Christian, not just, Lord, that we profess to be, but that, God, our life possesses those things certain biblical characteristics that would make it to be true. And so, Lord, we just pray tonight. Maybe somebody's come to church, but they're unsaved. They'll trust Christ and be saved. And, Lord, that all of us will be obedient to you. You have something to say to all of us, God. You never stop speaking to us. And, God, if we ever stop hearing you, then, God, may we, uh, may we diligently, God, come to you in prayer and in personal devotion and and ask God that you'd speak to our lives so that we might hear your word and feel the convicting moving of the Spirit of God so that we might continually, uh, Lord, be redirected back to the word of God and, Lord, that our lives might continually be growing to be more and more like Jesus Christ. So you be glorified tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. The word real, the word real in the definition of the word, we find these statements, real, to be real or something that's real. It means to be true. It means to be accurately conforming to the type. It means to be genuine. It means to be authentic. Being what it seems to be. Being what it seems to be. And that's the definition of real. Some of you here are old enough to remember when the first generic brands of groceries began to come into grocery stores. You know, year, for years, if you bought uh, an item at the store, there were certain brand names, and that's what you bought. You chose which one you wanted. You were Jif or Peter Pan or whatever kind of peanut butter you are, uh, crunchy or 
peanut or not, and you bought that brand. But I can remember when the generic brands first started to come around. If you remember down in Lower Ironton across from the bowling alley, that was a Kroger's years and years ago. You remember that? And that's the first place I saw generic food, Kroger's. You remember they had a whole line of cost cutter food. Do you remember that? You'd go in Kroger's and if you went to the chip aisle, they'd have Doritos and Snyder's and Lay's. And then in these big bright yellow bags with a pair of scissors on the front, it would say cost cutter and it would just say chips. You know, that was it. And they were cheaper. Uh, they weren't the real thing, uh, but, you know, you could buy them. If you went to the soda aisle, you would find Coke and Pepsi and Mountain Dew, but then there would be these flats of these bright yellow cans of soda, cost cutter cola, cost cutter lemon lime, cost cutter whatever, grape, you know, whatever it was, and they would be cheaper. They were generic. We termed we, we, we kind of coined that term generic, meaning it wasn't really the real thing, and, and it was cheaper. It had been cheapened. There was compromises made in making that for the sake of, of the cost, the price. They were imitations of the original. But you know, in the, day, in the day that we live in today, there's a great need for real Christians to be real. Uh, the lost needs to see real Christians. They need to see that, that it is powerful, this thing called salvation. That it changes our lives. That we're never the same after we're born again by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That it changes us from the inside. That there, that there is a power there that God can and will change our lives. The lost need to see that. And God wants His people to be real Christians. He's given us the type. He's given us <clears throat> the original in His Son, Jesus Christ. And we must be more than cost-cutter kind of Christians with you know, a few Christian radio stations programmed in our radio. Uh, we need to be more than just uh, someone with a few t-shirts with spiritual phrases on them, have a bumper sticker, uh, other spiritual propaganda. We, we need to be more than that. Real Christianity is more than that. Our families and children and our loved ones need to see us be a real Christian. They need to see us live a real Christian life. We look into the Word of God to see Jesus Christ in the Scriptures. And when we see Him, we see what a real Christian should be like. He's the real thing. Uh, he's authentic. And we are, to, we are to align ourselves with Him. We're to be like He is. Like so many spiritual and biblical things, though, the world has taken them and made them to suit and fit their needs and desires. Jesus Christ is the type. He's the pattern. If we're to be real, then we must fit His pattern. But there are so many today who profess to be Christians who, who do it with uh, an attitude. They, they have the mindset, well, I don't care about what Christians used to be. And I don't care about what the Bible says. And that's kind of their approach to this new kind of Christianity. They break the scriptural pattern and make what it means to be a Christian something altogether different than what we find in the Word of God. But there are some truths that we find in God's Word that help us identify a real Christian from a worldly Christian. One of the scriptural characteristics of a real Christian is that they will really care. There'll be some things they care about. They'll care about what God says in His Word, and they'll care about others before themselves. And I want you to see these simple things tonight about a real Christian. Number one, a real Christian cares about God's Word. They care about God's Word. Verse 22, James writes to the believers, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Be doers of the Word. Caring about what God says in His Word uh, enough to obey it is the mark of a real Christian. That's the mark of a real Christian. A real Christian hears God's Word. He cares about the will of God as it applies to his life personally. 
uh, his family. They, they care about what pleases God, what, uh, what, what obeying the word and will of God in their hearts and homes mean to them. A real Christian cares. James says that a real Christian will be a doer of the word, not, not of their own will, not, not of their own way, but they'll be a doer of the word. And it's true, it's true of every one of us that know the Lord's our Savior, born again by the grace of God, that none of us are perfect and sinless. None of us are. First John chapter 2, uh, he tells us we're going to sin because we're still in these fleshly bodies that are condemned as sinful and corrupt and, and we still are going to fight sin in our life. And First John 2, 1, he, he lets that be known. He said, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When we as the people of God sin, and we will, Jesus Christ is our advocate. And by confessing and forsaking sin, he pleads his blood on our behalf before the Father. And he cleanses us of that sin and unrighteousness. And, and he secures and maintains our relationship with God. But I think, though, that even though we understand and know that we are going to sin, there's going to be times we fall, we falter, we fail, that we must remember that. Just because you are born again and saved, you still have an accountability to God and His Word. I don't know, it seems like this new kind of Christianity kind of has the mentality that, yes, I'm saved and born again, and I'm on my way to heaven, but now, now I don't care so much about what the rest of the Bible says. I've kind of gotten what I want out of this thing, and now I'm going to do what I want to do. But a real Christian cares about what God's Word says, what the will of God is for their life. And once we're born again, we have to remember that we're still accountable to God and His Word. You are still responsible to continue on in the Word of God obeying, yielding, and growing in the Word of God. Salvation in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that's just the beginning of our relationship with God. It's an ongoing one. And it is by, it is by remembering this accountability and responsibility to God's Word that we do grow. If you're, if you're born again and you're right with the Lord, right in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I believe you'll have a desire in your heart to walk in obedience I believe there'll be a desire in your heart. You'll care about what God's Word has to say for your life. All of the Word of God, not just the parts that you like or you're comfortable with. If, if your relationship is where it ought to be in the Lord. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, we find this verse of Scripture that's so significant because it's the only time in the Bible you'll find the word success out of the thousands of words that are in the Bible. This word's only in here once. And it has to do with true spiritual success, success as God sees it. Don't think there's a person here who would say, Pastor, I just, I, I'm just going to set out of my goal in life not to be successful. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody here that would say that. But we do that spiritually. We do it spiritually, seemingly. In first Joshua chapter 1, there, the first chapter, verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. Now, that was Joshua, the leader who took over from Moses. This was, this was centuries before James, led of the Spirit of God, wrote in James here the text that I read to you tonight, Be ye doers, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. And yet Joshua, all those years ago, said the same thing. He said, this book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate in it therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all, all that is, uh, that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We'll never be successful as a born-again believer spiritually until we begin to care about what God says in His Word. Until we begin to obey it and we begin to yield to the Word of God. God spoke to His people through Joshua there and He spoke of them about doing, to do all that's written in the Word. And it's still the same today. John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. He'll keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode unto him. 
In our text here in James, he's led the Spirit of God to point out that the Word of God is like a mirror that we are to look into it. James 1 verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We're to look into the word of God just like you would look into a mirror. Verse 23 and 24, he gives you that physical illustration of how a man can go and look in the mirror and look at himself but, but then as you stop looking at yourself and you drift, you move away from beholding yourself, uh, it's hard for us to get ourselves in the picture of our mind's eye. Uh, we can more readily do that with people that we see all the time, but ourself, that's a different thing. But we're to look into the Word of God like a man would look into a mirror, but, but instead of forgetting what we see there, we're to, we're to uh, apply it to our life. We're to look intently into the Word of God every day. See ourselves as the Word of God reflects our hearts and lives. See who God sees us to be. Obey His will and His Word. You know, we should look into the Word of God to see and remember who Jesus Christ is. Because He's our pattern. Just as, as uh, some of the places you work, there's some type of quality control where somebody's going to come by and check the tolerances on your machine or check the quality of the product that you're putting out or that piece or component and how it's going to affect the overall product. We need to spend time in the Word of God looking to the Lord because He's our example of who a Christian is. And we ought to be lining our life up to see if we fit the pattern are we lining up and fitting Him? We should look into the Word of God to see Him and surrender to Him and obey His will and, and, uh, and His Word because it sets us free. You see it, James refers to the Word of God as the perfect law of liberty. Liberty meaning freedom from oppression or influence by something else. And it will be when we completely surrender uh, to the Word of God and to the will of God that we are set free from anything and everything else that would seek to influence and oppress us. The world, the devil, and our own flesh. How can we overcome them? How can we have victory over them? How can we not become like they are? When we yield completely to the Word of God, when we surrender to the will and Word of God, that's how we have victory over those things. In verse 22, be ye doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You ought to mark those phrases, doers and deceiving. Because right now, you're either a doer or you're deceived. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious... Notice that phrase, seems to be. You know, there's some today who profess to be a real Christian, and I don't think they even truly know what it means to be born again. They don't understand their sin or to recognize the authority of God's Word. And you know, you can, you can find that out if you're around them very much. And, and, and notice what, uh, what James wrote. He said, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue. And Matthew chapter 12, the Lord, the Lord said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever's in your heart eventually comes out your mouth. And if you are around people long enough, and you listen well enough to what they say, you'll see that for many of them, there's nothing real and genuine in their life in the matter of faith or salvation or surrender to the will and Word of God. And I'm not saying it's because they have a foul mouth or a filthy mouth. I'm saying if you'll listen to people talk long enough, it'll come out in them that there's a spiritual emptiness there because you'll begin to pick up on what their understanding of life is all about. What means life to them? What are they pursuing? And, and if you listen to people long enough, their ideologies about the issues of the world, it'll reveal to you whether or not there's any spiritual foundation in their life. And many, many uh, that profess to know the Lord and be real Christians, they don't even know what it means to be truly born again. 
But you know, even many truly born-again people are deceived about, about, about what being a real Christian really is. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, here's that passage of Scripture out of Mark in our Bible. And never forget that he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our own hearts is who he's talking about. They're wicked. They're wicked. Their nature is sinful and corrupt. And they're deceitful, our hearts. Our hearts are deceitful. We, we can deceive others and we can deceive our own selves. He goes on to say, I, the Lord, in verse 10, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Many born-again believers are obeying their heart. They're not hearers and doers of the Word of God. And their heart has convinced them that they're okay. The Word of God, God will by His Word, if they'll look into it, if they'll be a hearer and a doer, it will convict them that they're not being real, that they're not being genuine. But your heart can convince you that everything's all right. I'm okay, I'm good. Verse 26 says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion will be in vain. A real Christian cares about what the Word of God says. We care about the will of God. We're not going to listen to our heart. We're going to look into the law of God. And we're going to find the Lord Jesus. And we're going to be sure that what we think, we feel like would be pleasing to Him. What we say, what we do, where we go. Uh, the things we put into our life, the things we're leaving out, are these the things that the Lord would do? Is this what I see in my Savior? And if not, we're going to line up with what the Word of God says about what being a real Christian is. But a real Christian cares about the Word of God. Number two, a real Christian cares about the needs of others. Here's a phrase in verse 27, pure religion, pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father. I want you to understand this word religion. It's not a word that defines a man-made system of beliefs, of rituals or rites that he practices to make himself acceptable to God. That's our understanding of religion today. That's what religion is. And we often say that we're not, we're not preaching religion. We're preaching in redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. But many men are religious in the fact that they're, they're practicing faithfully and sincerely some man-made method or system of being accepted by God. But the word religion here, this Bible word for it, that's not what it means at all. This word means the outward actions and expressions of the inward presence of Jesus Christ. You remember when Paul wrote about uh, that, uh, that we ought to work out with trembling our own salvation? You remember when he said that? He wasn't saying that we had to figure out a way ourselves to be saved. He's saying that what's in you, you need to let work out of you through your life so that it impacts the lives of others. And this is what this word means. It's meaning the presence of Jesus Christ in your life, when it's real, when He's there, when He's present, it's going to express itself outwardly in the actions of your life. We, we see it here that there will be, notice please, the presence of service. There'll be service for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see people today who, who serve false gods. They, they serve a Jesus Christ who's not the true Christ of the Word of God, who's God in human form. Uh, they serve a Jesus who, who is just a man or is just a teacher or just a prophet. And yet they serve Him with sincerity. They serve Him with dedication. They make sacrifices uh, far more than we who know the true and living God. Think about the Mormons. If you're, if you're a member of the Mormon church, you young people, you're getting ready to go to college, you know that every Mormon... 20, 18, 20, 25 years old, sometime in that area of life, you've got to spend no less than two years in a Mormon mission field if you want to stay in the Mormon church. You have to go somewhere, Africa, someplace, someplace where there's some Mormon missionary, and you've got to put your life on pause for two years. It's interesting if you ever follow college sports, 
BYU, Brigham Young University. That's the, that's the Notre Dame of the Mormons. And those football and ball players, you go down and look at their roster at the ages of some of them. Some of them guys are juniors and seniors in college, and they're 24, 25 years old. Why? Why are they so old? Because they had to put their life on hold and go on Mormon mission for two years. You see the Jehovah Witnesses and knocking doors everywhere around the world. We were told by Brother Lyon, listen, don't let the ladies wear dressy skirts and clothes because they'll think they're Jehovah Witnesses over here and the Jehovah Witnesses have a bad reputation. Don't, don't dress that way. You'll be perceived to be that. Uh, you, think about, you think about the sacrifices. You think about how people, you think about the people who, who are Muslims who have to travel some time in their lifetime to Mecca to bow down to the, to the, uh, to the cube at, at Mecca and worship at the cube if they're going to secure a place in uh, paradise someday. Then we who know the true and living Savior, how little we really know about dedication and sacrifice and service. A real Christian cares about the needs of others. They, they live their lives to make a difference spiritually. A real growth and maturity in your spiritual life will be exemplified by not needing to be helped all the time. But instead, you've grown to the point where you're looking for ways to help others. You're looking for ways that you can make a difference spiritually in the lives of other people. Notice he says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. The focus is no longer on me, it's on others. That's, that's the life of Jesus Christ was absolute sacrifice of Himself for others. That's what His life was all about. Real religion, a real Christian is someone who visits. They reach out. They seek to put themselves between heaven and hell for other people. Jude said in Jude 22, And if some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. We're constantly looking for someone to reach out to, to make a difference, because we know that if someone doesn't make a difference, they're going to spend an eternity in hell. James gives the invitate or the illustration here of, of visiting the fatherless, the widows. And I thought about how very real the bus ministry is. I don't think there's too many things in a local church we're doing that's more scriptural than, than what we're trying to do with reaching people through our bus ministry. The bus ministry, it's 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 as real a work that there is in the New Testament church. So many homes where there's fatherless people. You knock on a door, some little boy or girl comes to that door, no mom, no dad, they're not home, one's in the bed, can't make it to the door, or, you know, my, my dad, my, my dad, he's in prison. And, you know, my mom, she's in jail. You'd be surprised at how many people that we meet in the bus ministry, they're fatherless, they're motherless, they're without a parent. And even the ones that have parents, they're without a real biblical parent with scriptural influence in their life. So many homes, so many homes where there's only one parent struggling, being overcome by the world, the devil, the lust of the flesh. But a real Christian sees a need like that, and they serve. They're serving the Lord Jesus. We see Jesus Christ as our example. In John 13, verse 13, He said, You call Me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This is, this is John chapter 13. This is, this is one of those passages from John 13 through John 17. We call it the holiest of the holies of the gospel. Only John's gospels record what you find in John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. Now the other gospels have that. The Holy Spirit chose John, the beloved disciple, to pen down these things. And the picture here is Jesus Christ in the upper room. Judas is still present. And the Lord Jesus takes a basin of water and takes a towel and he kneels down in the floor and he takes off the shoes of those disciples and he washes their feet. 
He says, you call me Master and Lord, and you do well to do that because I am. I am your Master and Lord. He says, he says ye ought also to wash one another's feet. Now, the thing we have to be sure is we don't get hung up on the, on the washing the feet, see? He wasn't, giving, he wasn't giving a church ordinance here. He's giving an illustration. He's getting ready to give a church ordinance when he gives the Lord's Supper. Because he said, this do as often as ye do it. He was commanding them to do it. Notice he says here, this ye also ought to do. You ought to do it. Here's the example. You ought to follow it. He says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And the life of a real Christian is a servant's life. Servant's life. Like our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what a real Christian is. This is a real Christian. They care about the Word of God. They care about the will of God. They care about pleasing God. They care about lining their life up with the biblical pattern of Jesus Christ. A real Christian cares about the needs of others. Life's not all about what you can do for me. It's all about what can I do for someone else. This was the life of Christ. This is our example. We're to serve. James gives us some examples. Visit. Get out and make a difference in the lives of the fatherless. Get out and make a difference in the lives of the widows or the singles uh, parents that are there in your community. Try to reach them for me. A real Christian. Number three, a real Christian cares about the testimony of Jesus Christ. They care about the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. Before God and the Father. You see that? Our lives are being lived out before God the Father. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And notice that last phrase, to keep himself unspotted from the world. A real Christian doesn't want to be worldly. They don't want to be worldly. They want to be like the Lord. The word Christian means like Christ. They want to be like the Lord, not like the world. They don't do things like the world does things. I'm not interested in doing something like the world does it just to get people to be interested. I want to do what we do according to the pattern of the Word of God because someday I'm going to have to stand before the Lord. This is, this is God's Word we're reading together. If we use the term Christian and apply it to ourselves, we are wearing the name of Jesus Christ in this world. If you say, I'm a born-again believer, I'm a Christian, then we are taking His name upon ourselves. We're bearing His name. A real Christian will keep themselves unspotted, meaning pure, from that which will defile Him. But it seems as if that doesn't matter to so many people today to, who call themselves a Christian. And I believe it matters. I believe God believes it matters. Because here he says that you ought to be pure. You ought to be clean, unspotted by the world. It matters to God. We ought to care that it matters to God. We ought to care about our testimony for Jesus Christ. Young people should keep themselves pure. Physically and spiritually. Husbands and wives should be faithful to one another. God's people should love Jesus Christ above all else or anyone else. 1 John 2 verse 15, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The world here doesn't mean the rocks and the trees and the grass and the water and the mountains and the air and the animals. No, it's talking about the world system. The way the world ticks. What makes it tick? What makes it go? What is its priorities? What does it think about things? Its philosophies, its ideologies, its values, what it places priority on. That's what the world is. And the Lord said, don't be like the world. Don't love what the world loves. But so many people today who take upon them this name of being a Christian, all of those things line up more with the world than the Word. The way they look, the way they dress, what they listen to, how they have church, all these things. 
far more like the world than the Word. The word worldly should not be able to be used of a real Christian. Shouldn't be able to look at a real Christian and say, well, you know, that's, that they, they, this was worldly about, them, about their life. Nothing, nothing that would cause someone to think of the world should be a part of the life of a real Christian. Acts chapter 11 there talks about the believers in Antioch. The Bible said they were called first Christians in Antioch. And I've told you before, I don't believe it was because the church had a business meeting and who has this suggestion about what we can call ourselves. Someone says, I believe we should be called Christians. Who will second that? I'll second it. We'll vote on that. Okay, now we're going to put that outside of the door of the church. I believe they were called Christians by the people in Antioch. I don't believe it was necessarily flattering to them. I believe they, they saw them. They saw people who separated from the world. I believe those worldly Antioch people got convicted by the lives of those people trying to love the Lord and serve God. And they, they said, well, they're just trying to be like that Christ that we used to hear about. They're Christians. They're Christ-like. A real Christian is different from the world. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. A real Christian is different from the world. A real Christian is distinctively biblical. We, we're biblical people. We're Christ-like. That's what the very word means. And don't forget, and James alludes to it here, keep yourself unspotted from the world. But, but what he's thinking about, I think, is what Titus says. Titus reminds us that Jesus Christ is coming. Titus 2, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And I believe both James and Titus are saying that a real Christian loves God's Word, cares about the Word of God, cares about the will of God, lines himself up with the Word of God, looks intently, diligently into it till it shows him who he really is, and then he makes the changes. Makes the changes. All of you get up in the morning and walk in the mirror, and you look at yourself and how you survived the night, and you say, first thing, man, i got to make some changes here before I get out of, out of the house. You know? And we comb and cover and dab some makeup on or whatever we got to do. We must do that spiritually. We need to look into the Word of God every day and say, Lord, you show me what you see when you look at me and let me make the changes I need to make. A real Christian cares about that. A real Christian cares about others. They grow to the point where it's not about what you can do for me. They begin to see how God can use me to make a difference in the lives of others. This was who the Lord was. He said, I came not to be ministered to, but to minister, to serve. Every real Christian is going to find a place of service. There's going to be somewhere they can plug in and be serving the Lord. Uh, and, and a real Christian cares about the testimony of Jesus Christ. They don't want the, uh, the people to look at their life and, and see the world or see the worldliness of the world in their life. They want people to see Christ in them. And they remember that the Lord Jesus is coming. He's coming again. And when he comes, may he find us unspotted from the world. Pure, pure. May he find us a, a, a peculiar people zealously serving him. I just want to encourage you tonight, be a real Christian when the Lord comes. Be a real Christian. Let's bow our heads and we're going to pray together. Maybe you came to church tonight, but you're unsure about being saved. You struggle with that. God wants you to know that you have eternal life. You can know that based on the foundations of the Word of God, the Scripture, the truth that we find there. If there's any doubt, then you ought to come and just and settle it once and for all. And if you know the Lord as your personal Savior, I just want to challenge you as we begin this study of what a real Christian is like to let the Lord speak to your heart. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Listen, length of salvation does not equate to spiritual growth doesn't matter how long you've been saved. 
doesn't matter how long. What matters is do we care about the word of God? Are we hearing God speak to us? And are we looking into his word? And are we lining our life up, not with our neighbors or not with the people next door that go to some other brand of church than we do and, and this, that, and the other the things of the world or life. We're not looking at that. We're looking to the word of God. We're looking to the pattern of Jesus Christ. We want to be like Jesus. We care about our testimony for Jesus Christ. We care about serving and reaching out, making a difference in the lives of others. I want to encourage you, challenge you, we start this, this series of messages about being a real Christian. Be a real Christian. The lost need to see it. Your family need to see it. It's going to change. It's going to make a difference. Those, those Christians in the first century turned the world upside down. They reached their world for the gospel of Christ. And, it, and it's because they were real Christians. May the Lord help us to be so. Lord, we pray in your name tonight. We ask that you would just minister to every heart in life. We pray we'll be obedient to you. We'll let your word, God, as you speak to us through your word, have an impact in our life. We'll care about your word and your will. We'll be doers of it. God, we'll care about our testimony because we are a professing believer. We'll care that our life really, really does justice to the name Christian. We'll care about serving others. We'll find a way to make a difference in the life of other people because you came and gave yourself completely for us. You served us. You gave us that great example in the dirt on the floor in the upper room and said that the servant's not greater than the master. As I have done, you ought to also do. May we serve. Put on the apron of service like a real Christian. Serve the Lord. May the Lord help us. We pray in your name, Lord. Now we'll all be obedient to you. We'll do just what you're speaking to our hearts about right now. We'll not hesitate. We'll just obey. And we'll trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together. We're going to turn to hymn 282 and look at that first verse, hymn 282, in our hymn book. And you just be obedient uh, as the Lord speaks to your heart tonight. <clears throat> 282. Let's sing that first verse. <clears throat> Sing the second verse, verse two. thankful for uh, the message and I'm thankful for another uh, just good truth from God's word we're glad you're here tonight and we're just praying the Lord will help us uh, to be doers of the word take uh, take these truths and and apply them to to, my, to our lives I know for me uh, as someone who's been uh, coming to church now all my life and for so long that uh, I've seen you know all the passages in the Bible right and I know those things but uh, this that truth being a doer and and a caring about God's word I've got to be reminded of it often and and uh, uh, not to just to let these things be things that are in my mind and and things I know about but they're truths that affect my heart and my life and so I'm thankful for the for the for the truth today and we're we're glad we have a pastor who faithfully preach uh, the word of God to us so we're glad we're thankful for that today amen all right well we're uh, thankful you're here we'll be back on Wednesday for uh, regular services and uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. Do you want to do that course, course before we finish? Uh, we've got the. Are you doing the new one or the? 
The old one. Do the old. Okay, we'll do the one that's on the bulletin, the old one that we've been doing, and uh, uh, let the Lord have his way. We'll, we'll do that before we finish up here today. His way in my life every day. There's no rest, there's no peace until the Lord has His way. Place your life in His hand, rest secure in His plan. Let the Lord, let the Lord have His way. Let the Lord have His way in my life every day. There's no rest, there's no peace until the Lord has his way. Place your life in his hand, rest secure in his plan. Let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. Amen. Hope that's our prayer today in our lives. All right. Well, we'll have a word of prayer as we finish up. And uh, we're just glad that you're here. Hope you'll be back on Wednesday night. Rusty, will you pray for us, please? Thank you. Amen. Amen. 